Hi, and welcome to week two of Hot Pack Cold Pack Factor Fiction. Today we're going to talk about two different kinds of hot packs, and the first deals with supersaturation. But before I get there, we have to talk about crystallization. And before I get there, we have to talk about Gibbs free energy. And that's where we're going to start. Let's talk broadly about the concept of crystallization. Liquid water turning into solid ice is a great example of the two thermodynamic processes that govern our chemistry here, and really a lot of chemistry. The first one is entropy. Entropy, very loosely, as I was unceremoniously corrected by my inorganic professor in grad school, is a measure of disorder in a system. So if disorder increases, entropy increases. Now an increase in entropy is represented by a positive number. A decrease in entropy is represented by a negative number. Again, entropy is disorder. So in our water example, a whole bunch of disparate water pieces just floating around as a liquid, forming into a very organized patterned crystal structure is a decrease in the disorder of a system. We are becoming more ordered and more structured, so that's a decrease in entropy, decrease in disorder. Going the other way from solid ice to liquid water, we are decreasing the order, increasing the disorder in the system, so we have an increase in the entropy. The other thermodynamic process at work here is enthalpy. Enthalpy is, again, loosely the measure of heat in the system. So if heat is either released or absorbed, there is a decrease or an increase in the enthalpy. So we're looking at heat. If a process requires energy to happen, we call that endothermic, and an endothermic process is represented as a positive number in enthalpy. The flip side, an exothermic heat evolving reaction is represented by a negative number. The trouble here is we know water can exist as a liquid or as a solid, or really for that matter as a gas also, but who wins in the discussion here? Is it the entropy or the enthalpy that decides what state that water is going to be in? Well, the answer there is something called Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is one of my favorite things in all of chemistry because it explains basically how anything ever works. This is the Gibbs free energy equation. G, the free energy, H, the enthalpy, T, the temperature, and S, the entropy. This is how the equation works. When G is negative, that means the process, whatever that may be, is spontaneous. So at those conditions, if the number is negative, it will happen all the time and doesn't need anything else to occur. On the flip side, if the free energy is positive, that means the process is non-spontaneous. So there's nothing that can happen to make it go. With the numbers of the enthalpy and the entropy, just looking at the signs here, there are four scenarios we can look at, positive or negative for each of them. There are two that are really easy. If your enthalpy is positive, meaning you have an endothermic process, and your entropy is negative, meaning you have a decrease in disorder, increase in order, so we have an endothermic order increasing, disorder decreasing process, you can see that the negatives here cancel out and the free energy will always be positive, meaning these processes will always be non-spontaneous. Doesn't matter what the temperature is, these numbers are always going to be positive, positive, add up to a positive number. Flipping that, when we have a negative enthalpy exothermic process and a disorder increasing entropic process, you can see that that will always be negative, negative, the free energy will always be negative, the process will always be spontaneous. The other situations where you have a positive and a positive or a negative and a negative, that's where things get a little bit tricky. Water crystallizing and a lot, a lot, a lot of crystallizations out there are one of those two tricky cases where it is an exothermic process. We're creating those bonds from the really disordered liquid to the more ordered structured crystal lattice, but we are losing entropy because we're increasing the order of the system. We're going from that disordered water to a very ordered ice molecule. Here, the G number can be positive or negative and it depends on the temperature. So if you have a low temperature, low number in the T multiplied by the S, this number here will be slightly negative, so negative, negative, positive. Usually it is not large enough in magnitude to make the overall Gibbs free energy positive. So at low temperatures, these processes are spontaneous, which it makes sense. When water gets cold, it automatically freezes into ice. On the flip side, if you have a very high temperature, this number is going to be large, cancel out the negatives as a positive, the free energy will probably be positive as well. That makes sense too. We can't really freeze water in the desert. 
You can see that temperature plays a pretty big role in deciding whether a process is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. And that, my friends, brings us to the hot pack. Sodium acetate, this molecule shown here, inorganic compound because we have the positively charged sodium cation and the negatively charged acetate anion, exothermically crystallizes like a lot of other stuff we see. The trouble is it happens at 324 degrees Celsius, so that's not really something we can access typically on Earth here. Luckily for us, this creates an exothermic crystallization in water, so we can make a solution and access that at practical temperatures. Additionally, luckily, sodium acetate makes what's called a supersaturated solution. So let's get into that. For a given solute, you can keep adding it to water up to something called the saturation point. There, any additional solid you try to dissolve will either just fall to the bottom of the container or promote dissolved solid to precipitate out of the solution. Sodium acetate is unique in that it can cause a supersaturated solution, meaning there's more sodium acetate in the water at that temperature than should be theoretically possible. It's kind of a thermodynamic cheat. The free energy to make that sodium acetate precipitate out absolutely exists, it just doesn't. Well, why not? Turns out this exists in something called a metastate. Let's look at it this way. In a normal dissolving solute, as we increase temperature and increase solute, we go up, 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 and then we stop. When we cool that solution back down, we've reached the saturation point of that solute, so some of it will precipitate out of solution. When it exothermically crystallizes, we release energy, and we eventually come back to the equilibrium state of saturated solute with the additional stuff that was too saturated coming out and at equilibrium. With sodium acetate, this doesn't happen. Exact same process up to here works where we have all of that solute at that given hot temperature, but when we cool it back down it doesn't automatically go to the equilibrium state. It ends up coming along into this little energy well, which again is that metastable state. So when we get that supersaturated solution, the energy of that crystallization has not been released because it hasn't crystallized yet. We need a little bit of energy to get over this hump to make that sodium acetate crystallize and precipitate out. That comes in where if you look at the sodium acetate hot packs, there's a little clicker in there, like a little metal circle that you use to make that happen. When you snap that clicker, that's the energy that's required to put that metastable over the hump and then go back down to that equilibrium state. That's why the sodium acetate hot pack gets hot. That super saturated solution exists in a metastate that when you hit that little metal clicker gives it enough energy to overcome that metastate, flow back down to the equilibrium state, releasing all of that energy from the exothermic crystallization of the super saturated salt. Ha! The great part about the sodium acetate hot pack is it's reusable. Because we're just dealing with a physical change, that is the sodium acetate going from one phase to another, supersaturated dissolved solute into a solid, we can redo it. All we have to do is put the energy of that back in, get to the supersaturated state, and then back down into this little energy well metastate, we can do the whole process over again. Let's switch gears and talk about hot packs that are air activated instead of being a super saturated solution that we use the clicker for. They're air activated because essentially the reaction is very fine iron powder oxidizing to become rust via a series of reactions shown here, 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 and here. You can see the iron's oxidized to iron 2 plus, the 2 plus is oxidized by creatively oxygen to iron 3 plus, the iron 3 plus reacts with water to iron 3 hydroxide, and the iron 3 hydroxide interconverts to this kind of iron 3 hydroxide oxide combo thingy and water. Now there is one more reaction that's probably going to give you something that looks fairly familiar. This reaction here, it has the main molecular formula of what you'd think of as rust, iron 3 oxide, and water that comes out. Those air activated iron powder hot packs do have stuff to soak up the water and a couple of other things, but the real meat and potatoes of that and the exothermic reaction that creates the heat comes from that oxidation of iron into iron oxide rust. And that's the hip happening world of extra hot pack chemistry, because I knew you just needed to have it. See you next time. Tina, you fat lard, eat your dinner!